welcome to Winner Take All. I'm Alex Mosed, where we talk about the constant battle to fight back and win against big tech monopolies. Big week, ginormous week. We're going to have a little fun with the show. A little bit more casual t-shirt, t-shirt kind of show. Fun show today. Man, they're just doing some crazy stuff. Okay, so Bolt. Bolt is a payment startup worth $11 billion officially. Rumored to have a new fundraise coming out, valuing it at $14 billion. Okay, not even announced yet. And in September of 2021, so five months ago, it was valued at less than $5 billion. So I don't know. I don't know what's going on with the CEO. He's actually no longer the CEO, Ryan uh, Breslow. I wish him the be- best. I don't know if he's having some health issues or personal issues. I don't know. But something's going on in this guy's head. He is now no longer CEO of Bolt. And it all just happened in like a 10 day period of time, starting with this tweet. January 24th, Stripe and Y Combinator, the mob bosses of Silicon Valley, a thread this thing went viral on Twitter, basically starts talking about how his company, Bolt, in a coordinated fashion, was blocked out of getting investors, getting into Y Combinator because Y Combinator uh, already had Stripe that went through Y Combinator, so Y Combinator didn't want to allow a potential competitor like Bolt into Y Combinator. So they're blocked out of Y Combinator. And then all the investors who invest with Y Combinator and or some mixture of Stripe also then pri- tried to put the, you know, the uh, the screws to Bolt and, and them getting any potential investors. And he talks about a bunch of examples about how, you know, the, the mafia in Silicon Valley have worked to keep Bolt down and he has surely stuck it to them right in the eye with his $11 billion valuation. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Sean McGuire, if you don't know who Sean McGuire is, he's a partner at Sequoia. And he goes, I can't sit idly by while this steaming pile of doo-doo goes viral. I like Ryan and have known him for years. That said almost everything in this post is wrong. Most importantly, the real reason why he struggled to raise is because his metrics haven't been good enough. The plot thickens. Okay. Then you've got a post here on Hacker News, which in Ryan's tweet thread from Bolt, he says that Hacker News is basically kind of co-opted by Stripe. If you don't know what Hacker News is, it's it's basically kind of like a Reddit forum style started by Y Combinator. You can upvote things, you can comment, you can downvote. In the tech industry, that's the place where all the you know, techies go for news and new product releases and launches and all this kind of stuff. Now there's this post on Hacker News a couple of months ago, technical engineer, engineering manager uh, who was interviewing for an engineering manager of managers, you know, somewhat senior role, who had, had a horrible series of events where he was actually offered the job and then they reneged on offering the job and then they like tried to shuffle him off to some other department in the company. Very weird, completely unprofessional. And what's interesting is so this guy clearly had a bad experience, very unprofessional, inappropriate experience. And then um, you have a couple of people pile onto this and say, for those who have worked around and at Stripe for the past decade, this is not a surprise. Stripe, especially the founders, have a quite a poor reputation for screwing over people in and around their orbit. Uh, almost every fintech startup has a story of Patrick, one of the founders of Stripe and CEO, um, reaching out about an acquisition, mining them for information, playing along, and then ghosting them. Same thing for candidates. Then you get another comment right after that, right? So this post came out 63 days, and then literally like Within a few hours of that original post going up, you get this anonymous post from some co-founder of some unicorn fintech startup. Then you get another comment, same day, also a founder of an X billion dollar fintech. Exact same story. Patrick and John dangled an acquisition to get a look inside and ended up retrading on the terms. That means they give you terms and then you do more diligence. And then before you actually complete the deal, then you say, "Eh, you know, actually I want to change the terms. Retrading. Big no-no, very looked down upon. There's just a lot of stuff out in the water um, in and around Y Combinator, Hacker News, Stripe. Now, okay, Ryan's not done. Five days later, Ryan, another thread. Y Combinator is not worth it, a thread. 
<laughs> These days I get asked by founders all the time, should I do YC? My answer used to be probably not worth it, but if you really want to, sure. He wanted to get into YC. He applied. They didn't let him in because they were biased against Bolt and they had their, you know, their bias. They had Stripe. They didn't want Bolt in. Today, given what YC has become, my answer is a hard no. Here's why. The truth, there's nothing that pisses me off more than the mob stuff that goes on in Silicon Valley. First and foremost, the cost is beyond predatory. For $500,000, this was new, we did a video, YC now giving half a million dollars to startups as opposed to like a buck 25. Used to be 20 grand back in the day. For $500,000, YC has two separate safes, one for 7% and one at the earliest possible valuation in your company. The result, they own 10 to 14% of your company out of the gate. This is enormous ownership, which I agree, 10 to 14% is, is enor enormous ownership of the company. But the math doesn't make sense. And I've talked about this before. I don't know. These people are smart. Like they understand math. But this math does not make sense. The information, the media coming, they also do this weird math at a 14% ownership stake. That means that YC is acquiring 7% of the company for $375,000. You do the math. It, you actually, if you want to do the math properly, you have to account for the dilution from the original 7%. So it's actually a little bit more than a 7% stake for uh, $375,000. But anyway, just keep the math simple. 7%, $375,000. Okay, makes sense. Divide by 0 0.07, you get $5.35 million. There is no way that you as a YC company are coming out and raising money at a, at a sub $10 million valuation. No way. Pre-COVID, Pre $10 trillion of printing money, pre asset inflation and inflation everywhere, pre all of that, YC founders, I know because I know them. We have employees in the company that went through Y Combinator as founders. You were getting 10 to $12 million pre money valuations coming out of your YC demo day. 10 to $12 million. That is more than double a $5.3 million valuation, right? Now, with COVID and asset price and $10 trillion of inflation, right, type of valuations, it's more than that, not less. So, you know, to me, I'm saying if you're raising at a $14 million valuation, right, okay, $14 million valuation, $375,000 is actually less than 3% dilution. YC is coming in at less than 10% ownership. I see very little to no possibilities where YC is walking away with 14% ownership. We've covered this before. YC doing half a million dollars in this current structure, this two-tier structure is a net net absolute positive for founders. You had Paul Graham actually responded to this tweet thread about Y Combinator, co-founder, Paul Graham, co-founder of Y Combinator. They own 7% out of the gate. The second investment is uncapped and thus equivalent to getting a $375,000 advance on whatever you raise after YC. It doesn't delete you any more than your post YC raise would, but gives you the money immediately so you're net ahead. It's very hard to beat them up on this. I don't see the logic. So now two days after the YC post, a week after his original post calling out Stripe, and now two days after his next post calling out Y Combinator, Ryan Breslow, no longer CEO of Bolt. His 10 plus billion dollar company. Says it's his choice. And now I've never really listened to this guy speak. I've just, you know, you see these people, these tweet threads, you don't, you know, you don't really know who they are. And so I found this video, which maybe helps us get to know the guy behind the tweets a little bit more. Does not help him, by the way. Welcome. I, I have what might be a surprising take to you. Um, I'm sure a lot of people are thrilled about a four day work week, but I never want to have a job that I hate so much that I only want to work it four days a week. What say you to that? Well, I have another surprising take for you is a lot of people want a four day work week. And another surprising point is that people think that this is going to lead to less productivity. At Fold, we believe that this four-day work week is going to lead to a surge in productivity. Kind of a weird rebuttal, like pretty much an easy question. So I guess they've now moved their company to a four-day work week. Okay, that's weird. What is this, France? Two is obviously like, obviously you're going to get that question. Hey, like if your employees really like what they're doing, why would they want to work four days, right? Like, the absolute most predictable question you could you could you could get. You're going on CNBC, 
you have a definitely a media person who's prepping you on stuff like with, with your company's worth at this point, about $5 billion. And so this is September of 2021. Seems completely unprepared. His response and the way he's delivering his response just kind of seems like aloof. I don't know. Let's listen. Is going to lead to a surge in productivity. Well, I mean, that doesn't surprise me at all that a lot of people feel that way. And my sense is that, um, you know, if you've got a job that you just sort of want to get the check and get out, then sure, working fewer days and being more productive sounds great. But if I'm learning a lot, right, and if I love working with my coworkers and what I'm creating, don't I want to be productive and work five days with partners? Okay, that background noise, that's not me. I don't have dishes going on in the background. I guarantee you that's not the CNBC guy. It's got to be coming from his audio feed. So, okay, who does an interview with CNBC? And like people are doing dishes in the background, okay? He's got a $5 billion company. Interview with CNBC. I mean, don't you tell like, hey, stop, stop making a ruckus in the background? Like, hey, I'm, I'm about to go on TV. What? There's just so much weird stuff with this. I think talking about the time people work is one of those concepts that we're leaving in the past. At Bolt, there's only one thing that matters, and that's results. That's the outcome. You have to achieve results, and you have to do so while being kind and good to your team around you. And so, frankly, we don't care if you're working two hours a week or 200 hours a week. If you're passionate, go for it. But we only care about are you delivering results to the organization. 200 hours a week, actually not possible. What kind of answer is this? Oh, two or 200, like, okay, you hire an engineer and you say, hey, engineer, we need you to build this stuff. You say, if the engineer works 20 hours a week, like, it's just not realistic. This is the classic kind of, this is why Silicon Valley gets such a bad rap, right? It's like, this guy is so out up in the clouds, not facing any kind of reality. Um, it sounds nice and fluffy, but it's all, it's all a load of BS. You, you, you listen to this. You actually believe what this guy's saying. Oh, yeah, we don't care. Two hours, 200 hours, not possible. Was he making up time now? You add this context. It just, it just doesn't seem, just doesn't seem like it's all there. My first impression was this guy's got some really bad, like personal health, mental, I don't know, some other life events. I don't, I don't want to judge the guy. I don't know the guy. This was when I was looking at the, the Stripe and the Y Combinator tweets. Now I watch this video and I'm thinking to myself, this guy's up in the clouds. This guy and Jack Dorsey might be going to the same ayahuasca trips down in Tulum. Are these guys hanging out? Are these guys best friends? Because this guy's interview right now reminds me of Jack Dorsey buying Tidal for $400 million. Like whatever happened to that? Oh yeah, that's right. The worst, probably one of the worst acquisitions in the past decade. There's just weird stuff going on here. And the video in this interview, I think, helps bring some more context to those tweets. Where if you're just reading the tweets, I don't know, it's hard to get a feel for the guy. Now you watch this video and you're like, oh, I don't know, man. Something weird, something weird in the water over there. What is with these guys in kitchens? Ryan's got dishes in the background. Jack Dorsey's doing a congressional hearing from his kitchen. There's way too many similarities with these two wonky CEOs. I'm kind of now pro Ryan's exit from Bolt, just like I am completely pro Ryan, uh, Jack's exit from Twitter, and I'm praying and waiting the moment when Jack exits Square. Oh, Square. Oh, wait, sorry. Um, block. Okay. Who spends their time thinking of this stuff? Okay, more fun news, funny news. From a few weeks ago, but still wanted to hit this for a while. San Francisco-based DoorDash is requiring engineers to deliver food. And they're furious. <laughs> of course they're furious. You know, it's so funny because our clients who are traditional multi-billion dollar enterprises, not your hotshot, you know, tech startups that have been around for two years, three years. But these are businesses that have been around for decades. And I would say... And I put this article in front of some, of some of our clients and their executive teams. They had a very visceral reaction. And I agree with them because their employees, their team members, they wear it with a badge of pride to be able to go out into the field 
and just learn, right? And and help um and 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 really understand what it takes to do the work. And so it does not surprise me one bit the smugness. And again, just going back to the the bad rap that Silicon Valley has gotten is not undeserved. So what happened here is there's this anonymous social media platform called Blind. In order to create an account, you have to verify it with a with the email from that company's domain name, right? So it's verified that you work at that company. So DoorDash announces this, all non-delivery employees are gonna do a dash once a month. Maybe once a month is a lot, I don't know, but it's just like one dash, you just do one, one delivery, like from your car. Whoa, it's not like you have to walk or go on a bike, God forbid. Now a 1500 comment thread on Blind, this anonymous social media platform, was started last week by a disgruntled DoorDash worker, an engineer with a reported total compensation of $400,000 a year, griped about the responsibility, says what the actual F word, I didn't sign up for this, there was nothing in the offer letter slash job description about this. Some people said it would be good to, to, to learn what delivery workers have to go through. Then other people said, absolutely not. For employees unable to do deliveries, there are other programs in place to work with service employees and businesses. I think this is a great initiative. And I'll go one step further. You don't want to do the program? Do what um, that guy, Tony Say, the uh, founder of Zappos did, right? Pay you, at that time, it was a lot of money. This is, I don't know, 20 years ago, right? He would pay you $10,000 to get the hell out. This is what I would do, you know, but make it 50,000, I don't know, 20, 25,000. $25,000, get the hell out of my company. You don't want to go do a dash. You don't want to go and really understand the business and, and what your constituents, your consumers, your producers, more importantly. What do platforms take advantage of? Producers. Understand what your producers go through on a day-to-day -day basis. These people are just struggling to make ends meet. You can't take it out of your own cushy $400,000 a year compensation to go do a dash once a month. You're getting paid. You're still getting paid. It's not like he's not paying you to go do a dash. It's just ugh, not appropriate. Could it be time to fire the deceptive CEO of Robinhood, Vlad, and actually then buy the stock? Another company that I love to rag on, Robinhood, now at sub $15 a share, a uh, thing has tanked in the past, you know, since going public, they went public um, in July of, of, of last summer by almost 60%. Uh, down to less than $15 a share, down to about $12, $13 billion market cap. At the time of IPO, definitely said there's no way this company is worth that much money. Called it. You can see their, their ARPU, average revenue per user, was going down, but it seems like it's kind of leveled off. It's not a platform business. They call themselves a platform. It's not a platform business. The funny part of this article, because we're doing a fun episode today, before diving into the details of this report, there's one thing I think Hood sh shareholders should unify around. Vlad Tenev needs to go. I mean, look at this photo and tell me the market doesn't think this is the Martin Shkreli of the financial world. Martin Shkreli was the guy in the farmer world who jacked up the prices. And then I think he's in jail for a decade or something like that. Vlad has completely gone against the entire ethos of what Robinhood, why Robinhood was created to help the small guy, the retail investor. They take advantage of the retail investors through how they monetize and A and B, they were not upfront and transparent and honest about the dealings they had with the regulatory authorities during the meme stock mania days of, of last summer and spring. And ultimately, that hurt and, and disadvantaged those that they are in business to protect, which are the retail investors. And it benefited, you know, the man, the hedge funds, et cetera. I don't think he handled it well at all. I think it really really has hurt the company from a brand. People have not forgotten about that. How do you really believe in the mission, the ethos of the company when the CEO behaved like he did and he's still there as the CEO? So let's read on. I think this company would re-rate about 50% higher overnight if they brought in a seasoned industry veteran with decades of experience. Yeah, maybe at this point they sub out the CEO. They sub out the CEO, Vlad. This thing definitely goes up. Should you buy it based on that hunch? Uh, I don't know. Okay, last topic of the day. More good news in the fight against big tech. A solid win, count it. Google has lost their battle and has now settled with Sonos for basically pirating Sonos's technology. 
basically what these big tech monopolies have done when they want to enter new markets is they go to the existing smaller tech players, like in this case, Sonos, and they say, hey, we want to do a partnership with you. And then they just ripped all their IP and then like a year or two later, launched all their Google Home devices. Magically, out of nowhere, they just figured out how to have all the devices sync and talk to each other over Wi-Fi. Like, oh, doesn't didn't Sonos do that for like a decade or more to develop all that tech? Yeah, that's right. They did. And fortunately for them, they patented it. And fortunately for Sonos, they were big enough that they could fund a multi-year, easily cost them probably hundreds of millions of dollars. And think about all the distraction from the leaders to have to focus on this lawsuit. The time and resources of the leadership and then all the legal fees and lawyer costs, easily hundreds of millions of dollars worth of costs to the business. I hope they're getting a nice big fat check from Google and it gets better. U.S. regulator rules that Google infringe on their patents. And now there's more than just financial remuneration coming to Sonos. They have to change and actually degrade the Nest product capabilities. In fact, the Nest team has recently announced some changes to speaker groups, which it said is due to a recent le legal ruling. Hmm, this one. The most notable change is that going forward, users will no longer be able to adjust the volume of all speakers in a group all at once. They'd have to adjust each speaker individually instead, right? So you could kind of just drag, change the volume of all your speakers in a group. That functionality has now gone away. Is that going to be the death knell to uh, Google Home and Nest speakers? Probably not, but what is it? A positive development in the, in the fight to fight back and win against big tech monopolies. Yeah, so they went to the International Trade Commission and they said, hey, Google's importing these products and they're violating our pens. And that's how they fought this thing. It wasn't through kind of the proper courts, which I'm sure they also... Sonos has tried that as well. But this um, kind of th this uh, news, the regulator in question here is actually the ITC who's saying, Google, you cannot bring your products into the country because those products are infringing on Sonos's patents. I mean, it's amazing how they it's crazy they had to go to that degree to hold Google accountable as opposed to kind of the more classical court system. But hey, count it. It's a win. We'll continue to follow this. And Sonos, uh, keep up the fight and uh, don't let them off the hook, which I'm sure you will not. That's it for us today on Winner Take All. Hope you enjoyed uh, today's episode. A little fun, fun episode today. And I will talk to you soon.